Hey guys, Coach here. Welcome to this week's episode. Thanks for taking a couple of minutes. You know, in modern suburbia, maybe this has happened to you or you've seen it where you live, the lots, the houses are sometimes getting bigger and the lots are getting smaller. So the landscapes, the available landscape space is kind of shrinking. Unless you're out in the country and you're on acreage, obviously it doesn't apply to you. Well, this week's episode is all about small scale ground covers for sun or for shade for some of those areas that you just don't want to do turf anymore and you want to use ground covers that are not going to be super aggressive and take over everything. So without further ado, small scale ground covers for sun or shade. Let's get this thing rolling. Thanks for coming back. Hey, first let's throw a couple little definitions so that we kind of are both on the same page. When I say small scale, I'm generally talking square footage area and generally, unless you're using it as a lawn alternative, kind of a ground cover that is gonna be used in conjunction with a lot of other things, okay? But square footage wise, 500 square feet or less generally a lot less. So we kind of know we're talking about that. And when we're talking about ground covers, yes, we could go into a bazillion different things of small, small, low shrubberies we could get into. All. But what I'm talking about right here is things that are going to be three inches or lower. And they're going to be the type of ground cover where a little maintenance is going to be required. You know, if you want to keep things neat and tidy, but it's not gonna overwhelm the area. So when as a design principle, when you have a lawnless landscape, you're looking at ground covers that are gonna make up about a third, plus or minus, a third of the overall plant material that you're using. Uh, the other third might be perennials, the other third might be small shrubberies, maybe divide that one third into sh small shrubberies and small trees, you get the idea. Then you bring in some of the other elements like uh, boulders or dry creek beds. You have some lighting, maybe a water feature. Maybe you have some other luxury items like an outdoor kitchen or a hot tub. So you can see how a small space, small yard can get chewed up really, really fast. And in this day and age, it doesn't really make much sense to have little piddly lawns that you're still going to have to take out a string trimmer or a uh, mower and mow once a week to keep it nice and neat. It just doesn't make sense. I have had clients that have deliberately asked for 100 square feet or less, 10 by 10 area, just so the dog had something to pee on. They wouldn't pee anywhere else. I said, yeah, you know, that's, it's a thought, but doggo's gonna go where doggo has to go and you don't have to take care of it. You don't have to do anything with the ground cover and the lawnless application. So when you're using these small scale ground covers, their main purpose is to fill in cracks and crevices, becomes uh, fillers over here and maybe spillers in between rocks and stuff over there. And they're gonna be at such a growth rate that you can maintain it. You can visually inspect it, you know, every month or so and know full well that it's not gonna go rampant and it's not going to invade into areas that you don't want. And if you have something that starts to creep into areas, you can go out with a garden knife or a, a small spade and you can kind of cut it out and keep it in bounds and force it to go down in other areas very easily. That's why ground covers are so versatile. They fill in so many different needs for a homeowner, both front or backyard, and yet the care and maintenance is not once a week. It's like maybe three times a year, maybe four times a year, depending on what you've actually planted. So I basically picked out 10, 10 that I have used, that I have had experience with, and that I know quite a bit about. And these particular, um, these particular ones are, some are gonna be good for part sun, part shade, even shady areas, and other ones will demand to look their best in a full sun application. When I say full sun, we're talking six, eight hours of direct sunlight per day, 365 days a year. Um, not that it goes into full shade during the winter time. 
Not that it goes into full shade in the summer because the sun is way high in the sky and now the X tree is shading it out. No, it's gonna want full sun six to eight hours direct every day. And those 10 are very, very useful and I'll give you a bonus at the end. So remember, these ground covers are small scale. If you wanna replace a large lawn or you wanna cover a hillside, this one is not for you. This one is for if you wanted to do a hillside and have various elements on that hillside, like a retaining wall or a boulder wall holding the hillside back, various bigger boulders tucked into the hill with elements, a dry creek bed or an actual pondless waterfall coming down the hillside. These are the types of ground covers we're talking about. Our number one out of the gate, in no particular order, but number one out of the gate is creeping phlox. Creeping phlox is a perennial ground cover. Its main claim to fame is its delicate look, which it is not delicate, and its beautiful late spring, early summer color. Uh, the later in the year, northern latitudes, you're probably going to see it in May and June. And the southern latitudes, you're going to see it probably in March, April, maybe early May at the latest. And then it goes green, but it likes to be kind of a moundy at first, and then the mound kind of slowly spreads into other areas. But you're talking something that is only going to get up about three inches tall. And again, through the later parts of the year, it might throw a part bloom, but usually not very much. And if you want to encourage a second bloom, get out there after the bloom is done with a pair of scissors and you can just clip off the dead flower heads and you can get it to regenerate a little bit. So creeping phlox, good alternative. Have used it a lot in rock gardens and stream beds over the course of my landscape career. Now creeping phlox is a full sun animal. It really appreciates uh, full sun all day long. If you give it shade, especially afternoon shade, you will watch it stretch vertically just a little bit and the bloom will not be nearly as intense come bloom time. It'll be a very partial bloom. So word to the wise, as far as feeding, give it a little bit of food twice a year, early, early spring, early, early fall. And I would probably say a synthetic liquid fertilizer, but you can also uh, dabble around with dry organic fertilizers as well. Okay, number two is sedums. Now, most people think sedums as a, a succulent cactus, something that can't go everywhere type. But I got news for you. Sedums are a very versatile small scale ground cover. They really are. Uh, you get into dragon's blood or Angelina sedums or Ogon sedums. These things can tolerate cold down into zone four, believe it or not. Yes, they die down to the they die down to the ground and then regenerate in the spring, but who cares? It's covered in snow. And then the further south in the higher growing zones, it's uh, year round. Another one that likes full sun. They generally like to bloom later in the year. Most of the time, mm, late July starting and going through mid-September. So you get a little bit of color. The dragon's blood sedum, it has a nice burgundy leaf, all succulent it is. Very, very deer resistant. Deer, from what I understand, are not really interested in sedums very much. But hey, you do your own due diligence. If you're way up north, you might have to order it this time of year, but in the springtime, chances are they're gonna have a good selection and they can always special order something for you. So keep in mind sedums, great fillers, great spillers, really adaptable to a variety of soil conditions and does not require much food whatsoever. Lastly, they do propagate really easy. You can dig out little sections of them and you can propagate it somewhere else and they root very, very easy. They're not a, a real delicate type of transplant ground cover. So consider that. You can also use them in baskets and patio things if you want things to spill over the side. I did do some uh, uh, drought tolerant container gardens before for clients where you had Dracaena palms and other types of things and then Angelina sedum spilling over the sides. Very dramatic. Very looked really good. Okay, let's move on. Now we're going to go off into something that's not industrial strength all the time, but surprisingly they do very well in small scale gardens. I used it very successfully on a lot of landscape projects that I've had and that is the mosses. 
Mosses specifically talking about Irish moss and Scotch moss. So you have the dark emerald green of the Irish moss and then the chartreuse almost yellow of the Scotch moss. And you put those two together and you have a very dramatic, dramatic type of uh, effect. I use them a lot in between uh, stepping stones. Uh, partial sun, like you could have full morning sun and then dappled sun through the afternoon. That's a perfect situation for them. They don't do super well in uh, really high dry climates unless you give them kind of a microclimate where you have overstory by trees shading their situation. And I don't think it goes down below zone seven-ish. Uh, I don't think they would tolerate the super colds, the way up north type of thing. But anything from seven on up, they do very, very well. And they look good creeping in and around and under boulders and rocks next to uh, retaining walls, like what I'm sitting on right here. You can get them to kind of creep over and soften the, the concrete edges of things. Very, very useful thing. So don't forget about mosses. On the coast, you can find moss in full sun. Where we're at right now, up in New Brunswick, Canada, they probably would not tolerate the winters, but they could grow out in full sun without any problem. So you guys out in the Pacific Northwest, I'll bet you some of you who are in the know have it out in full sun from dawn to dusk with no sort of risk of burning. Central Valley, where I used to live, yeah, it probably had sun from dawn till about 2 p.m. And then it kind of got shaded by some birch trees and whatnot. The other thing that you can mix it with is one of our next selections. The next one I'm talking about is carpet bugle or a juga. A juga, if you get the right varieties, is a very containable type of uh, ground cover. And you can use it for the same applications that we've covered so far, but you use the ones like jungle bronze or mahogany version of a juga, and then you mix it with scotch moss, now you've got a really nice contrast. And I did that very successfully at one of my own homes on a little berm hill with a boulder or two and a small scale Japanese maple. And it worked out really, really good. Dark, dark burgundy with that chartreuse color really set it off very nicely. Carpet bugle is a beast when it comes to tolerance of various soils. Hots or colds, it goes down to zone four and then bounces back very nicely. The one thing I would suggest is don't plant it near a lawn edge because if you do not pay attention to it, it can get into the lawn and come up in the lawn. So you don't want to do it. It's like, you know, six feet away from any sort of lawn and then maintain it, keep it in bounds. It doesn't go up very much. Jungle bronze is probably the tallest one because it's a rather robust leaf. Um, but the mahogany and some of the other ones, they tend to stay rather short and they're a run and root type of plant. So all you have to do is cut them. They do propagate pretty well. They do respond well to initial feedings, but probably only twice a year is ever needed. And they're very disease and pest free. So don't forget about a juga. Okay, this next one, this next one works really well in part shade to full shade. And if you have uh, boulders, if you have a lawn alternative or a slight hillside you're trying to cover and it's really shady, consider dead nettle, uh, also known as lamium. It has kind of a variegated leaf, so it's kind of a, a brightness in the deep shade anyway, and it goes very well with uh, some of your other shady shrubs and perennials. It is good where it is dry. It does not want to be soaking wet all the time, so consider it pairing with things that don't need to be saturated. Uh, ferns, azaleas, hostas, those types of plants, they don't need to be soaking wet, so lamium pairs with them very, very well. It does have kind of a flower in the summertime, although it's kind of a light lavender, and it really doesn't show very well, it, a little bit, but its main variegation is its claim to fame. So consider dead nettle or lamium as a small scale shady ground cover. Now you knew this one was gonna be in there, I'll bet you you knew it was going to be up there, but I would suggest only using one version of it, especially if you're up north and you're looking to uh, put it between flagstone or something like that. But it also works very good as a small scale if you pay attention to it, and you can even use it as a lawn alternative. 
and that is creeping time. I would suggest the woolly creeping time uh, only because it tends to be slightly more aggressive, so it covers a, a, an area faster. Uh, but just be careful not to plant a lot of it because it is very tolerant to very different soils and it too can go down well into zone four or even zone three and bounce right back. And I'll even show you a little bit of B-roll right here as far as what it looks like when it is actually up and running. It can be uh, persnickety if you give it too much water. It doesn't want to have a lot of water. So if it's getting overspray from lawn areas and that kind of stuff, and you're giving it too much, you'll see it yellow and oftentimes rot out where you just have that, the wiry structure of the ground cover left behind. So a little bit of water, full sun, not shade. It does not really want shade whatsoever. And then you obviously have the use of it as far as a nice edible herb. Okay, this one here is not often considered because it's a very old fashioned ground cover, but sold it and used it for many, many years, and that is Speedwell, also the, the Creeping Veronica. Creeping Veronica is a small scale ground cover. If you plant a lot of it, it'll cover more area, obviously, but used sparingly in the applications we've talked about here today, it fills out, only goes about two inches high, has a nice white bloom, and you can carve it up and use it and propagate it anywhere you want. It's not a uh, outlandish, beautiful type of ground cover. It's just a nice Kelly green that'll fill in gaps and, and spill over things. And it's not a super rapid grower. So keep Veronica, Creeping Veronica in mind as far as one that'll go from cold areas all the way down to warm areas without any problem. But Plant it sparingly. If you have a very small little corner project you're doing, sometimes only a six pack of it is all you're gonna need. All right, our next selection is one that came on the scene about 10 to 12 years ago. It's been around for a while, but the dwarf version has not. It's only been around about 10 or 12 years. And that is Dwarf Carpet of Stars, or known as Ruchia. And Ruchia, especially out west, has gained a lot of favor as far as lawn alternative. The dwarf one tends to be uh, slower growing, lower growing, and much more containable. You don't have to edge it as much. And I would strongly urge you to find a sunny location and put it in and amongst trees and shrubs, maybe a frontal border or whatnot. Uh, it tends to be a ground runner. Uh, and not a real fast one at that. It does respond to good initial feeding and then feeding about twice a year like the other selections we've talked about. And it is very low maintenance. It kind of looks like an ice plant. If you look at it up close, it looks like an ice plant, almost has like a, an ice plant looking flower that comes out in the summertime, but it's not one. It is its own little independent version of ground cover and very, very useful. I don't know the availability of it on the East Coast. You might have to look for it. But out on the West Coast, it's gaining popularity and tends to be available pretty readily, except for maybe the dead of winter. You might have to special order it from somewhere. But Dwarf Carpet of Stars, very, very useful and a good consideration for that small scale gaps and fillers type of landscape. Okay, our next one is good in uh, part sun, part shade type of situation. It's not a rapid grower at all. And oh my gosh, brush your hands across this. This is how I used to sell flats of it back in the 70s. I'd have them just say, yeah, this is creeping mint here. Rub your fingers across it. And they'd rub their fingers across it and smell. It was just a beautiful mint aromatic fragrance to it. Now do not let this be confused with spearmint, the herb. This is creeping Corsican mint and it is a small scale ground cover, kind of has a, uh, a baby tear appearance to it, but it is not baby tear at all. It is its own breed. And this one is something that you can use in that morning sun afternoon shade area in between stepping stones and whatnot. It has a very indistinct, insignificant flower to it. You don't even have to think about it. And it does not want to be saturated. Uh, so watering depending on your soil conditions and where you're at it may only be once to twice a week 
So pair it up accordingly with things that want the same water. Corsican Mint, a very, very useful little small scale ground cover for sure. And here's one they bet you didn't think I was gonna talk about. This one is actually an ornamental grass and it does pretty well. It doesn't go down to zone three, but I think it goes down to about zone six. And that's the blue festuca or blue fescue grasses. I used to always use the Elijah blue. And they're just a little cousin it type of grass, a little moundy one that does not spread any more than, oh, I don't know, 18 inches maybe. Gets about 18 inches tall with seed head. And I always suggest you go in there and trim those guys off. I used to give them little uh, haircuts. I would gather them up and just trim off the top and it kept them in a very neat neat arrangement so it, it didn't get wobbly and floppy or anything like that. The other thing is, is these were great to pair up with contrasting other like the purple ajuga and stuff. So you had this, this gray blue grass with the burgundy and then you had something behind it like rudbeckia or something and you get those color contrasts that really look neat. These two do not want to be soaking wet. They prefer kind of just a moist soil. And they're probably replaceable about every five years. Sometimes if they get too wet, they tend to rot. And you will, you will see what that looks like in a very quick hurry. So consider blue festuca grass, festuca ovina glauca. And then look for the Elijah blue variety. Very, very useful, small scale. You can kind of place quite a few of them and just create a small mass planting or just accent plantings in and around rocks and creek beds and whatnot. Okay, that's my top 10 of ones that I thought about, but I'll give you an extra one, an extra one that probably goes down to about zone eight-ish or so, and that is the clumping gazania. Uh, the clumping gazania, not the trailing gazania, is a great one for full sun, dawn to dusk. They get to be kind of clumpy about, oh, I don't know, 18, 20 inches across, and generally a primary bloom in late spring. And I mean a bloom. Has a very, very, there's so many different varieties. I used to use the Aztec red a lot. It kind of has a, a coppery red flower to it. I also use some of the gold and the yellow ones, depending on what availability was. These guys are kind of uh, not concerned about the soil they go into. They just don't like to be saturated. They prefer to be watered once a week or so and then let dry out of it. That's how they work best. Feeding twice a year, early spring, fall, they'll be good. And they give you kind of a, a very low maintenance approach to ground covers. The closer you put them together, the more they're going to fill in. But I would suggest using them as accent and spotted areas. If you do a particular mass planting, don't make it super, super big. And remember, it'll keep on blooming, maybe not as much as it's spring first push, but it'll keep on blooming if you go in there and deadhead stuff. So consider that. So there you go, a total of 11 small scale sun and shade ground covers that you might want to research, and maybe it'll work for a landscape project you're considering. I have a website for you youryardcoach.com and there I do a pretty darn good job in my humble opinion as far as teaching you through an ebook or a course and you can also consult with me if you want to talk to me directly through Skype or Zoom uh, for a landscape project questions and kind of having a, a coach over your shoulder help you through it. So maybe you'll take advantage of that. So until next week I always say to your landscape success thanks for staying with me consider giving me a thumb up for the algorithm and also subscribing for every week a quality DIY education that I try to bring to you. Any questions, you can email me, youryardcoach at gmail.com. I will make sure I get back to each and every one of you. Thanks for staying with me. I'll see you guys next week. Bye for now.